now to a Gravitas special. What happens when a North Korean citizen defects to the South? Dramatic footage of a soldier from the North making a dash across the border to the South stunned the world only a few days back. Now listen to the story of three other defectors just like him in their own words. Vyond's Manish Shukla has been getting you ground reports from the demilitarized zone between the two Koreas. This is the latest in our series of exclusive reports on North Korea. Vyond has blurred the faces of the defectors to protect their identities. These are visuals the world has rarely seen. The North Korean soldier's daring dash caught on camera. He was shot at and injured. By the time he collapsed, he was out of their reach. In the cover of darkness, South Korean soldiers then carry him away. But he's not the only one. North Korea as many as 15,000 North Korean defectors now live in the South. Oppressed under the autocratic regime, they fled the North and somehow managed to cross the border alive. South Korea Before Kim Jong Un came to power, a few lucky ones managed to flee via China. North Korea mein bhukmari phaili hui hai logon ke paas kuch bhi na khane peene ko hai Their lives were miserable in the north they didn't have enough to eat many didn't have electricity or proper houses they fled the north and reached the south via the china route North Korea se Chin hote hue aur uske baad fir South Korea aa rahe hain But once the whimsical autocratic leader took charge of North Korea the China border was fenced closing that escape route. My friend had escaped to China. After three years, she contacted me. My house is by the river. One day, I dared to cross it. Those who escape may have survived, but their family members are not spared. We are in South Korea, and here in North Korea, we are in South Korea. Thousands of defectors come here from the north. But when the regime finds out and identifies the defectors, their families are targeted. My aunt was taken into custody when they identified me as a defector. I don't know if she's alive. Vion spoke to some of the defectors about life in the north. South Korea ke khilaf the North Korean TV channels broadcast propaganda and negative stories about the South. They try to brainwash people that life in the South is full of hardships and the journey to the South is risky. These defectors told us that North Koreans are forbidden from watching any programs from the South or from China. They are forbidden from accessing the internet or gathering knowledge about the rest of the world. If anyone dares to flout the rules, they are banished to the outskirts where there is no electricity. I lived near the border. Before restriction, I could watch some Chinese TV. After restriction, some people sneaked in Korean or Chinese drama. But if government found out, you would be expelled to the countryside. Not just entertainment, the autocratic, tyrannical regime of King Jong-un also restricts access to education. Only the wealthy can hope to go to college. The rest are doomed to a life of labor. In North Korea, if you have to study more after high school, you have to be very rich. Otherwise, you work in a factory. The maximum possibility is vocational education. For me, there was no dream. There was no hope. That's why I dared to escape. Now, I have no fear. The women tell us of more restrictions that even extend to what they can wear. 
We have to cut our hair short. We can't wear short skirts or dye our hair. We hear of endless horror stories, but the South Koreans do not want war. They hope for unification and peace, though they are prepared for any eventuality. North Korea के मिसाइल और परमाणु हथियार जहां पूरी दुनिया के लिए खतरा हैं, वहीं उसके हमले का सबसे ज्यादा डर With North Korea testing missiles one after another, most South Koreans live under the threat of a nuclear war. And that is why the South Korean army is geared up for a special mission. A thousand soldiers have received training so that if needed, they can enter the North and target the leadership of the regime. With Manish Shukla in Seoul, in New Delhi, Rahul Dulal for Weon. Meanwhile, here's what's happening on the ground. The United Nations political chief uh, has begun a rare four-day visit to North Korea today. The trip by Jeffrey Feltman is the first by a senior United Nations official in more than six years. He departed for North Korea from Beijing, uh, from the international airport. North Korea had extended an invitation to the UN back in September to visit for a quote-unquote policy dialogue. The invitation was formally confirmed on the 30th of November, interestingly, just a day after North Korea's most recent missile test. Felt will meet North Korea's Foreign Minister Ri Yong, but uh, is not scheduled to meet Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un. Feltman is a former U.S. diplomat and the highest-ranking American in the United Nations and will be in Pyongyang until Friday. His visit comes as South Korea and the U.S. are conducting their largest ever round of aerial drills. Uh, Feltman was in Beijing yesterday. China, remember, is North Korea's main economic and diplomatic ally and has sent a top-ranking diplomat to Pyongyang only last month for talks with the North Korean leadership. is a response to a long-standing invitation from the authorities in Pyongyang uh, for policy dialogue uh, with the UN. Uh, we were able to confirm the visit uh, last on Thursday, uh, November 30th. Um, it'll be a wide-ranging uh, discussion. I'm not going to go in into uh, into any detail, but it is will be a wide-ranging policy uh, discussion. Meanwhile, the Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, Jeffrey Feltman, will be uh, will visit the Democratic People's Republic of Korea from the 5th to the 8th of December. Mr. Feltman will discuss with DPRK officials issues of mutual interest and concern, and he will also meet with the UN country team and members of the diplomatic corps in Pyongyang, as well as visit UN project sites. While in the region, uh, he will be in, uh, also visit China. In fact, he it was in uh, Beijing uh, today where he met with a number of senior officials. Joining us this evening on Gravitas, uh, Andre Abramian, strategic affairs expert on South Korea. And uh, Zachary Keck, Public Affairs Fellow at the Non-Proliferation Policy Education Center from Washington, D.C. Good evening to both of you. Andre, to you first. How significant is this visit of the United Nations representative to Pyongyang at this point? Well, we don't know yet how significant it may turn out to be because we don't have a strong sense for what the UN is willing to propose and what the North Koreans are also willing to do in terms of working with the UN towards some kind of compromise situation. And what's expected from it? Again, it's, it's difficult to know, but one thing we might look at is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, actually, earlier this year, U.S. Visuals. Senator John McCain called the current situation in Korea a slow-motion version of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And actually, during that period in 1962, the U.N. Secretary General Utan was very active in shuttling between the Soviet Union and the United States, and in fact helped provide political cover by uh, presenting initiatives as UN initiatives when really they were requests from one side or the other. So perhaps uh, Feltman on this trip is trying to set up involvement by the UN Secretary General, and then we'll see whether the United States or and or North Korea are able to use that office's stature to find some kind of compromise positions. Zachary, uh, the, the first invitation came in September. It's been six years since a United Nations representative traveled to Pyongyang. What has prompted the UN to make this move now? Well, actually, I think the invitation came from the North Korean side. I do believe that... Yes, but it came UN in September. It was accepted two months late. No, no, the, the, the North Koreans first broached the topic in September, but they didn't receive an official invitation until November 30th, is my understanding, at least. 
And I think the UN has always wanted to be involved in trying to settle this uh, dispute between North Korea and the U.S. and South Korea. So I don't think it's I think the U.N. would like to settle this, but in, with the, the greater question is what is North Korea's motive here? And we just don't know that at this time. All right. Uh, while this happens, uh, Andre, we know that uh, the U.S. and South Korea are conducting fresh drill, drills. Uh, this muscle flex flexing is going on. Are talks on at any level between the U.S. and the Korean side? It doesn't seem as if talks are imminent. Both sides are clearly trying to signal that, that they are tough. Um, although North Korea did open perhaps a little window after its last missile test when it said we've completed our testing program. We'll see if the United States thinks that's a genuine statement or a statement worth pursuing. But as of right now, both sides are still talking and acting tough. Zachary, looking at the facts of the case, uh, this military exercise uh, between the U.S. and South Koreans involves 12,000 personnel. For the first time, the U.S. F-22 stealth Raptors, which are precision, precision bombing aircraft that the North Koreans uh, will not be able to detect, are being used. Uh, the North Korean foreign ministry said that the Trump administration was, quote, unquote, begging for nuclear war. Trump's security advisor, H.R. McMaster, said, and I'm quoting again, North Korea is the greatest immediate threat to the U.S. Is the war imminent? I don't believe so. I think when you look at the actual reality, there's no way a war could be pulled off without the deaths of thousands, perhaps millions of people. And I think that kind of destruction really clarifies things for policymakers. I do think what the U.S. is hoping to accomplish with this military drill is more than anything else reassuring the South Koreans who have uh, been skittish, understandably, given all the advances in the North Korean nuclear program and missile program recently. Andre, there's been, uh, we've seen a year of dangerous nuclear brinkmanship from Donald Trump's statements uh, uh, to the response from the Korean leader. Reports now say that the U.S. is going to wait till March before launching an attack. What are you picking up? But with tensions so high and tensions lasting so long, there is the possibility that one side or the other miscalculates and tries to get away with something that the other side sees as a red line. So I don't expect an invasion by the United States, but I could see a mistake, perhaps a limited strike or some kind of flyby over North Korean territory that uh, initiates a response and then some kind of es escalation. I think that is something to worry about. People talk about March because that is a time, usually in the spring, when, when the Americans and South Koreans are running exercises. And uh, so they have more material on the peninsula than usual. Zachary reports also telling us that the CIA has told Donald Trump uh, that he has a three month window in which to halt the North Korea's uh, the North Korean ICBM program, after which Pyongyang will have the capability to hit American cities, including Washington, with a nuclear payload. Well, I haven't seen those reports, but it makes sense. The last North Korean uh, ICBM test last month was showed that it had the cap the missile had the range to reach Washington D.C. most likely, but the re-entry vehicle did not survive. So they seem to have to do a few more tests before they have the capability. Either way, though, even if North Korea can't hit the United States with a nuclear weapon, they very well could hit South Korea and Japan, which would cause untold destruction and kill thousands, perhaps millions, depending on how many were used including a lot of Americans on the ground. Coming back to the visit of uh, the United Nations representative, Zachary, is it clear that uh, Kim Jong-un from the very beginning wanted to be called to the talking table and he's willing to talk now? No, I don't think it's clear at all. I think what's clear is that Kim Jong-un wants to acquire the capability to launch nuclear weapons strikes against the United States, whether as a means to deter the United States from invading North Korea or for some coercive measures. I think that's what's clear. It's possible now that as he, as the enough tests demonstrate this capability, that he will be willing to negotiate with the United States and South Korea. But I don't think that he will be at this time because he hasn't demonstrated that capability, as I was just discussing. Andre and uh, Zachary, thanks very much for joining us with your perspective. This, uh, as I said, remains uh, a developing story in the Trump administration. Still, some say believe that uh, believes that China holds the key. How much is China willing? To intervene uh, from the American side is a question.